Next on Broadway Profiles, we're not throwing away our shot. The new space to vaccinate the Broadway community. Plus, she's one of Broadway's biggest talents on the stage. We'll talk to Tony winner Jesse Mueller about how she's working to support the behind the scenes heroes during the shutdown. And a little later, Becoming Simba, an exclusive behind the scenes look at the star of Disney's The Lion King. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles presented by Broadway.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Well, the plan is in motion to get New York's theater community vaccinated and safe so we can get Broadway back in business. I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. It's up to you, New of some big time Broadway stars, New York City has now just opened a vaccination site for the theater community in Times Square. From the outside, it doesn't look like much, but behind these doors, healthcare professionals are administering 2,000 COVID-19 vaccines a week. Hamilton creator and star Lin-Manuel Miranda helped open the new site. Forgive me, I'm emotional. This is the most people I have seen in a year and a half. I'm sure you feel the same way. And this is the first live performance I've seen in a year and a half. They say the neon lights are bright on Broadway. They say there's always magic in the air. I'm thrilled to be here at the opening of a vaccination clinic for Broadway workers. And that's everyone. And if you worked on Broadway or you worked off Broadway, you work in the theater, if you worked in the wardrobe department, if you were a stage manager, if you were a front of house staff, you're an usher, you are welcome to this incredible facility. We want to gather again and we want to tell stories in the dark. We cannot do that if we don't feel safe and if you don't feel safe. So the first step in that process is getting our vaccination shots. Another bright spot about this vaccination site, it's being staffed by dozens of laid off Broadway workers in administrative roles. One of the latest victims of the COVID-19 Broadway shutdown is Mean Girls. The Tony nominated musical by Tina Fey will not reopen in 2021, joining a handful of other Broadway shows that have closed for good. The Mean Girls National Tour, though, is expected to move forward once it's safe. Despite that bad news for the Broadway production, one of the stars is already moving forward and moving on to television. We're talking about Renee Rapp, who made her Broadway debut in the fall of 2019. Now she signed on to star in a new series on HBO Max, The Sex Lives of College Girls, written and produced by Mindy Kaling. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper has the story. You are going from Broadway to making your TV debut, which is super exciting. What about this role was calling your name? Why did you audition for this role? I think, the, well, the first thing that drew me to the role initially um, was that it was a Mindy Kaling project. Then as I started to, you know, read parts of the pilot and um, get an idea for like who these characters were and who these main four um, ladies were, I was like, Mm, that's a that's a room I want to be in. That's a that's a story that I, I want to be a part of. There's a lot about my character that you find out later in the first season that is <laughs> very parallel to me. <laughs> there are a lot of things that I feel like I, I really relate to um, her kind of coming into herself. So yeah. Yeah, you mentioned um, this being a Mindy Kaling brainchild, and it's I mm. imagine hard to say anything to say no to something like that. To be honest, it, it's wild. It's wild because you know not only is is Mindy like incredible, obviously, but um, Justin Noble, who co-wrote and co-created the idea with her, is equally as brilliant. And all the writers are so cool. And it's really fun to do like Zoom readings and stuff. You see it being written and you see it forming and it's cool because like the the girls and I will have conversations about like oh well I think like maybe this could go in this direction or like I feel like I really speak to this part of this character and we'll come back to the next rehearsal and that will be written in. How 
is TV or producing something for TV different from Broadway for you? I imagine with TV, you get redos on Broadway, it's live. So it's like, <laughs> an opportunity. to be honest, I think my answer to this question will be better in a year. But mm -hmm. as of right now, the thing that I notice more is with Broadway and with just, you know, theatrical pieces as a whole, it's easier for me because I don't have any time to second guess myself. And if I do, I'm still moving. So you're just being like forced through something. Aaliyah Chanel Scott, she is also like a musical theater, like baby, I guess you could say. And she's incredible, but we were both talking about how like, it's a moving train. Like you don't have an option to jump off. And you know, when we read scenes, we're like jumping in and out every five seconds because we're like, oh my God, like, did I say that line right? Did I deliver that right? It's easy to get removed and out of your head. But yeah, it's it's very different, very different. But I like it a lot. You make me feel, you make me feel like a Jessie Mueller is one of Broadway's most powerful voices. She won the Tony Award in 2014 for her role in Beautiful, the Carol King musical. She's also been nominated for her performances in Waitress and Carousel. Now she's doing some of her most important work yet, doing her part to help Broadway's behind the scenes workers who are struggling during this pandemic. You've done a lot of giving back during this time of, of your time and um, with different, different organizations, the Costume Industry uh, Coalition. Can you talk a little bit about that? Basically, the, the gist behind the coalition is to advocate for the survival of the New York City costume shops, because I think a lot of people look at the New York City artistic environment and, you know, you see the museum shut down and you see Broadway shut down, you see these other artistic endeavors, but you don't see the behind the scenes of what's really happening and, and the other people that are affected, the dressers and the costume people and the people who take the tickets and all of that. So um, this, this coalition was formed to really bring attention to these these small independent businesses that are so affected by this shutdown and particularly these costume shops, which um, include the actual costume shops, um, which are independent businesses and also all the artisans that work in them. If we lose them because they have to leave for financial reasons, we don't know if we can get them back. It's just, it's a, it's a great time to, to remember that there are so many people involved in these artistic endeavors that we do. And so um, this was one of the, the pieces that, that came to my attention and uh, I was really happy to, to get behind them and do what I can. look at some of the different roles that you have taken on and they're just such incredible and iconic roles. Um, do, you, do you look back at that right now? And, um, and what do you think, I mean, with regard to going forward? Because I know that Broadway comes back. We're gonna come back like gunning, you know what I mean? I, I think people people are ready, people need it. People people are kind of like aching for that artistic expression, both the people that, that, that that do it, that do the expressing, the people that receive it. Um, it's interesting you put it that way. I have been reflecting a lot on the opportunities that I have and and the privilege of those opportunities. And um, and I just keep kind of exploring the, the depths of that. I, I feel so fortunate to have been a part of the things I've been a part of. And I, I guess coming back, I'm not thinking about what do I do want to do when I come back or what role do I want to do or where do I want? It's not that so much. It's like, how can I come back with how can I be helpful in terms of getting more equity in the theater, mm -hmm. getting more equity in the industry, um, making sure that that more people are represented, that everyone is represented, because that's what we're going to need, especially coming out of something like this. So I guess I'm thinking more in terms of that. I hope theater comes back. I know it'll take a while, but theater comes back more affordable at some point so that more people can have access to it. You know what I mean? Tony winner Jane Krakowski is one of our favorites. She's been a fixture on the Broadway stage since the late 80s and a legit TV star since the 90s. Now Jane Krakowski is back on television in not one, but two shows. We make music and you make money. I was longing to do something with a live audience. And I always 
remembered name that tune. Uh, it was a game that we played in my childhood home. I had a very musical family. We were very competitive yelling at the television, watching Name That Tune. And um, when I heard Fox was doing it, I was thrilled to be a part of it. It felt like the money we were giving away had more meaning at this current time that we're all going through in, in the world right now. Oh my God, he's so insane. It's a very different part for me, which was what I was drawn to. I love the the idea that they were taking the life and times of Emily Dickinson and sort of reflecting those times through a funhouse mirror of what life is like now, especially for young people. Mrs. D has a lot of growth with her daughter in season two, which I was very happy about. I got to do a lot more scenes with Haley um, Steinfeld, who I love and think is doing such a beautiful portrayal of Emily Dickinson. And I couldn't think of really a more perfect actress to be representing Emily Dickinson. Coming up, Becoming Simba, an exclusive behind the scenes look at the star of Disney's The Lion King. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching Broadway Profiles. The Lion King is one of Broadway's longest running musicals with more than 9,000 performances. And when Broadway returns, so will Bradley Gibson as Simba. Before the shutdown, we got a glimpse backstage as he prepared each night to tell the story of The Lion King. Simba is a role that's kind of been in my life, my entire life, since I can remember. The Lion King was the first show I ever saw on Broadway, also the first movie I ever saw in the movie theater. So it's always been relevant in my life and always was around. In about 15 minutes of the show, I go upstairs to make up and the amazing Brenda O'Brien transforms me into Simba. She's been painting the faces of many men who have played Simba before me. The key to playing Simba is to have a, an ability to understand yourself, also understand how to navigate the, the heartbreak, how to go through heartbreak but also see the positivity in life having the positivity flourish through your life, but also, you know, being in tune with the pain. I go back downstairs, I start my physical warm up. I do a lot of stretching, push-ups, and um, just getting my body ready to do what I have to do on stage. Playing Simba has been an amazing opportunity because it's kind of forced me to see how strong that I am. Doing eight shows a week on Broadway is not easy in any capacity, but Simba is very physical. The show for everyone, The Lion King, is very physical. So you're having to take care of your body in a way that I've never had to before. And to navigate that is not the easiest thing in the world, but I've shown that I can do that. I wear a pair of harem pants. I wear a corset, which is beaded. A pair of shoes that are padded with cuffs on my ankles and my wrist, and also but last but not least, my Simba mask, which is a lion's mask, which has horse hair as the mane. Before I go on stage, I always say to myself, my mantra, I say, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Maya Angelou said that I live by that because I do it for everyone who came before me and everyone who's gonna come after me. And playing this role and being in this moment and standing on that stage every night is a moment of affirmation for me. For the latest Broadway news and buzz, let's go ahead and send it back to Broadway.com's editor-in-chief, Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Although Broadway is slowly coming out of the COVID pause, a slew of West End musicals have start dates in London this summer. And when you're old like 32, you'll love remember Jamie Liu, the kid who learned to fly. Oh, yeah. May 20th is a big day for returns, with everybody's talking about Jamie, the Olivier-nominated musical about a student who dreams of being a drag queen, starting performances. Also back that day, Amelie, the musical Charmer based on the Oscar-nominated French film, and Les Miserables, a concert staging of the beloved epic musical. Listen up, let me tell you a story. The Ex-Wives of Six will reign supreme once more on May 21st when the electrifying pop concert spectacle starts back up. There are also many proven hits ready to hit the boards once again. Jersey Boys heads back to London on July 28th with fellow long-running smash The Lion King roaring back on July 29th. Hairspray is set to return to the West End on June 22nd with Michael Ball reprising his Olivier-winning performance as Edna Turnblad. Then July 1st will mark the return of Stephen Schwartz's biblical musical epic The Prince of Egypt. 
based on the animated film. Welcome to Hollywood! And London audiences will be welcome back to Rodeo Drive when Pretty Woman the Musical resumes performances a week later on July 8th. Also coming to the boards during the hot months, some brand new shows. Will and Grace Emmy winner Megan Mullally will headline Anything Goes at London's Barbican Theatre beginning July 23rd. Back to the Future, the musical based on the hit 1985 movie starring Michael J. Fox, starts at the Adelphi on August 20th. That's the power of love. And Disney's Frozen will finally bow on August 27th with Samantha Barks and Stephanie McKeon as Elsa and Anna. These two have been ready to let it go for over a year. Looks like London is the place to be for theater fans this summer. Still ahead, it's the reigning Tony winner for Best Choreography. We're gonna talk to one of the performers from Ain't Too Proud the Musical about why he's just gotta dance. Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations won the 2019 Tony Award for Best Choreography. We talked to one of the great members of the ensemble, Christian Thompson, about why he's just got to dance. Hi, my name is Christian Thompson. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My childhood was constantly filled with the arts. My dad was a drummer. Uh, there was always music in the house, so I would always waddle around and just kind of be bouncing around to music. Because I was in an elementary school that was giving me arts programs, acting always looked like it could be a career. Acting and dance were always connected, simply because the way you learned theater in the public school program was through musical theater. It wasn't until high school that I started playing catch up in training and training in ballet um, and jazz, and it wasn't until college really that I started tap. But hip hop was always the foundation. It was always just like my passion project. It was kind of two separate worlds for a long time that always kind of informed the other. People don't often prepare you for when your dreams become a reality. And it's fascinating and fun and scary because you go, now what? That was the hardest part for the longest time was convincing people that it is a dream, but it's not just a dream. It's as practical as you saying you want to be an accountant. There's some vindication to, to being here, but as long as you continue to reach for that next goal and that next ring and keep trying to do better, I'm having fun figuring out what that next goal is. Here's some food for thought. Food of Love is back with a chance for you to learn Shakespeare in a whole new way. I talked to the group's co-director, Victoria Raysook. Food for Thought came about when we were deciding what to do um, next during the pandemic. We had our 12th night production and then we did a free series um, during the holiday times. Then we had some sonnets and things like that. And we didn't think we needed to do um, another full scale production because Broadway is coming back. There is going to be a chance for us to hopefully be on stage sooner rather than later. So I was like, classes, so many people are doing classes now. So it was really exciting to figure out a way to let them share uh, with our uh, followers and our audience members. It, yeah, it really is brilliant. And people are, I feel that people just are uh, absorbing information and they want new information. And this is something different. And uh, so Julie, tell me a little bit about it. I'll be offering workshops called Speak the Speech. In April, we'll be focusing on Julius Caesar and in May on Hamlet. And my approach is about finding different ways to free up the speaker, to play with language, and to allow yourself to be in a place to hear the possibilities within the language. So often Shakespeare is taught as a, there's a right way and a wrong way, or, or somehow we feel that ingrained within ourselves that, oh, I have to get the da 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 otherwise I'm doing it wrong. And what I like to bring to people and, and bring to people in different ways is, how can you find yourself within this? Bill, you have been teaching, you've been teaching Shakespeare to students for years, correct? Yes. I think the more that we, we know about Shakespeare, the more that we learn, the better we can appreciate his works. We find specific things in his works that we understand where they come from and the artistry that he's using, what he's doing, and it brings us closer to the text, I think. 
are they pre-recorded or are they are they live? And what are the different offerings that you have so people know? It is important to us that we have started to reach people from all over the world. Like Twelfth Night, we had people from England and Scotland and Russia, and we're really excited that we're starting to reach that. We wanted to make the series um, available to people in all time zones and even with busy schedules. So. You know, while we do believe the best experience is live, it will be recorded and able um, to be accessed later. And that's going to do it for us. Until next week, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. <laughs>